Sounds great. Thanks, Dustin. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for attending today. I'm going to start uh, by reading Virginia Tech's uh, land acknowledgement statement. So Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelamonic and people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationship with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutela Monacan peoples and other native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were pro <clears throat> prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to up prosim that I may serve in the spirit of community, diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable and inclusive community. Okay, so now it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Rafael Guerrero. Dr. Guerrero attended La Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, earning a bachelor's with honors and master's of science in biology. After that, Rafael relocated to the US where he completed a PhD at the University of Texas at Austin with Mark Kirkpatrick. <clears throat> no basketball statements, please. It happens at 4.30. After that, Rafael moved to Indiana University to complete a postdoc with Matt Hahn, where we overlapped for about eight months. He stayed at IU to work as a data analyst with the Precision Health Initiative before accepting his current position as an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at NC State. One of the many early career faculty who got to start in the midst of the pandemic, um, which I'm sure was <clears throat> a challenge in its own right. One of the most impressive things for me about Rafael is his quiet confidence. And you'll see that today. Um, a quick look at his CV and you'll see that a large fraction of his pub publications are actually from work outside of his advisory re relationships. So he, he just has a, a unique way of going out, making connections and really uh, um, forming relationships that last. <clears throat> I've also mentioned that Rafael brings this same confidence but, and leading by example to his commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, where he's active at all levels from his department through to his professional societies. Uh, and, and now for all of you who know me, here comes the personal anecdote. So here's an example of what I mean by quiet confidence. So um, when Rafael first started, he was maybe a week into his postdoc at IU. We, we always had these rather contentious journal club meetings where some people felt very strongly about papers and were very vocal about it. Um, and so I was going on and on about a particular paper as was Matt Hahn, uh, the postdoctoral advisor. And Raphael just quietly said, tell me more, what, what do you mean? So I'm describing what exactly I mean. And he said, ah, I see, and, and sort of with the precision of a surgeon sort of opening the layers, you know, figuring out what's going on. He said, Matt, I see your point, but you're wrong. <laughs> and that was when I knew that we would have a great working re relationship. So with that, uh, Raphael is gonna give us some insights today um, with a double feature. And I love this title slide here. He's gonna talk to us about hybrid inc incompatibilities in gene networks early sex and early sex chromosome evolution in nightshades, pardon my blunders. So with that, Raphael, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, David. Uh, I, thanks for that introduction and for the invitation, of course. Um, I will uh, commit a lot of blunders and I'm sure I was wrong more times than I was right in those meetings. So I'm glad that, I'm happy you remind, remember me as, uh, I don't know, uh, Quiet, wait, well, quietly confident fellow. All right, so yes, I get, as David hinted, um, I'm gonna just not even try to bring these two stories together. They are two very separate um, stories. Uh, and so we're gonna treat them as two different little talks. 
in my mind, in my kind of grand scheme of things, they are related and one day, one very, very long arc will converge into a single thing, but that is that will not be today. Um, here. Okay, so as all evolutionary biologists, I am fascinated by the huge amount of diversity that we see in nature. And I want to understand the forces that, um, the balance of forces rather that maintain diversity both within and between species. I've done that uh, mostly sitting at my desk, um, trying to take an approach in which I, uh, I wanna bring evolutionary theory and data analysis together. So sometimes I feel like there's gaps in the theory that could be um, filled to better understand the data, the observations that we are getting from the field. And in other cases, I think that there are better ways of analyzing the data sets such that they inform uh, and allow us to make progress in the evolutionary theory. So I want to sit right there at that interface. And that's kind of why uh, these two stories come together in a way. There's gonna be a little bit of data and a little bit of theory, and hopefully um, uh, it's something for everyone and not like disappointment for everyone. All right, so first part, I'm gonna tell you about hybrid incompatibilities and how they accumulate in time. So this starts pretty simply with you can imagine your favorite cartoon of um, ancestral species. Maybe this particular species only had two genes with alleles big A and big B. And then by some miracle of nature, allopatry happens and they start to diverge. And then two lineages start to just accumulate different versions of their genes, right? So in this particular cartoon, I have little A appearing in the top species and I have little B appearing like a, a little, little b appearing in the second species. Now, little a and little b have never seen each other and they can do pretty well in their particular genetic backgrounds, but they might go really poorly together. So if these two lineages happen to hybridize, little a and little b see each other, they, as I said, don't get along at all and they might create problems for the hybrid that carries the two alleles. So this model of hybrid incompatibility was first devised, of course, by work with uh, uh, Dobsansky and Muller, and some people credit Bateson for the like true origin of it. Most people call it dobsansky muller incompatibility. So on the, under this dobsansky muller model of speciation, we expect incompatibilities to accumulate faster than linearly with time. This is an um, kind of intuition first put forward by Alan Orr in 1995. So he understood this, is this very, very intuitive notion that if you're accumulating linearly, so they accumulating differences, these fixed differences through time, it, the kth substitution in this cartoon, my D allele can be incompatible with K minus one um, previous accumulated differences. So previous substitutions in this case, D could be incompatible with big A, little b, and little c. If you put together that notion that K incompatibilities can be incompatible, so K substitutions can be pairwise incompatible with K minus one in previous incompatibilities, you come up with like a quadratic formula essentially. So then the number of potential pairs of um, loci that can be incompatible snowballs with time. So it grows as genetic distance accumulates, the number of incompatibilities that I'm gonna call DMIs throughout the talk tends to grow at least in a quadratic fashion. And okay, as I said, that um, is typically known as Ohr's snowball. Here are a, a few basic snowball assumptions that, um, that Eleanor made. So first, I mean, verbally, that the probability of incompatibility remains constant through time. That is that if you assume that there's one little P parameter that quantifies how likely a random pair in the genome is likely to be incompatible, that P number stays the same through time. Second, that the genome is very, very big. So in other words, he assumed an infant sites model, meaning that every new mutation that accumulates is in a new site, and there's no kind of recurrent mutation in a new in, in in the sites that have already mutated. I guess that DMIs, that incompatibilities, have independent effects on reproductive isolation. This is a pretty contentious one. Uh, 
because it led to people testing the snowball effect by measuring reproductive isolation itself, which is a number, if you think about it, from zero to one. Either you're totally incompatible or you're not incompatible at all. That is not a particularly good assumption for reasons that we'll uh, discuss later. And lastly, and kind of derived from the two previous ones, that each locus participates in a single DMI. That is that all pairs, you know, so you have like separate pairs of pairwise incompatibilities that don't really touch each other. Okay, so people have tried to test this um, snowball effect with like actual data and a lot, a lot of work, even if you don't see the points on the plot here. This is work by um, Leonie Moyle and Takna Casado by, back in 2010. They took hybrids of tomato and wild relatives of tomato to put the, and, and measure two types of phenotypes of so fitness or fitness components, seed fertility and pollen fertility. And what they found is if the, that if they try to find a correlation between genetic distance on the x-axis and the number of ter sterility, sterility loci, these would be QTL that came up as significantly correlated with each one of these phenotypes. For seed fertility, you would find something like that quadratic effect that you expect under the snowball, but for pollen fertility, you don't. You see more of a line growing there. So the question remained here, where are the missing incompatibilities, right? What is going on that makes the snowball break in this particular case? So if we revisit the assumptions, I'm gonna kind of try to dive deeper into whether DMI, these two assumptions are hold true for tomatoes. So with that in mind, we set out to search for the missing incompatibilities that might be maybe Com complex incompatibilities, or maybe basically one locus in involved in more than one incompatibility, by testing the epistatic interactions among these or the original introgression lines. Let me tell you about them. So I'm going to call these NILs. They stand for near isogenic lines. And so if you have a whole genetic background of, for example, Solanum lycopersicum, domesticated tomato, and you've introgressed one little bit of, say, Solanum habercades you have a near introgression line, number one, you have that kind of homozygote form and the whole rest of the genome is uh, tomato. But it, I have a lot of those. So if I cross these two, I can come up with a double introgression line or a dill that will allow me to see the introgression, the, sorry, the incompatibilities or rather the interactions between these two genome, regions of the genome. So I'm gonna evaluate the phenotypes of the pairwise combinations of these introgressions uh, using a uh, single collection of hybrids precisely between Lycopersicum and Hybrocades. These are, this is a library of hybrids that was developed back in the 90s by uh, Dani Samir, and it's a really good resource for the community that's hosted out of uh, UC Davis. So what's important to us here is that I have 76 near isogenic lines that have little bits of the genome of Solanum Hybrocades introgressed into a background of Lycopersicum, right? So they represent roughly the whole genome of, of one species in the, in the background of the other. Um, so I'm gonna take 15 of these uh, to, take, to create all pairwise, all, all, almost all pairwise combinations to create those deals, right? So I'm gonna phenotype nil number one, phenotype nil number two, phenotype the dill, and gonna use the phenotypes observed for the parental nils to get this dashed line here of the accepted phenotypic value and contrast that with the observed value to uh, estimate esti uh, epistatic interactions and potential essentially complex DMIs here. I did that, or we did that rather, for 15 different uh, near isogenic lines, 15 separate introgressed loci. And I present the results in this kind of network shape. So each one of these points now is one separate um, uh, introgressed region of the genome. And from the kind of individual parental lines, we can already tell which ones are sterile and not sterile. So I color the ones that had significant effects on sterility for seed fertility and pollen fertility in red and gray if they didn't have a significant effect. If I do, if I try 15 by 14, uh, I would get more than 95, but some of them were just not possible to do. So we, I ended up with 95 double, double intergression hybrids. 
that I tested in uh, these epistatic interactions for. And these are the results. So on the seed fertility side, we found a pretty sparse network. So each one of these edges represents a significant interaction between near isogenic line one and two, for example, or A and B here. So there I found one, two, three, four, five, six separate significant effects that are clustered into three, um, you know, you can call them complex DMIs or three little clusters in the net. On the pollen fertility side, however, we found that it's all a single massive hairball, right? So all, all of the incompatibilities or all of the, sorry, all of the interaggressed regions that had an independent effect on sterility had epistatic interactions with one another and formed this kind of very, very complex looking, like potentially in a very exaggerated way, a single 10 or 10th order DMI. Um, of course, it is possible that there's a lot of noise in there, that there's like just multiple genes in a single interaggressed region, but that's the kind of um, resolution of the data right now. Okay, so if we go back to the assumptions, I would say that there is some evidence in these tomato intervention lines that DMIs are not independent, do not have independent effects on reproductive isolation, right? So the, the, in the, the individual effects of one intergress locus will depend on the rest of the background, suggesting that there's each one of those loci that I investigated participates in more than one DMI. And so we wanted to take that a little bit further to see like how conceptually how that would kind of feed back onto the snowball model. And the first kind of intuition that we had was that these gene networks that produce our, our, our phenotypes of interest can saturate. So imagine in this cartoon that I have a gene network of seven genes only, very, very small, and that the, the species of interest have uh, diverged in such a way that there's already three pairwise DMIs represented here by these red lines. So there's incompatibility here, here, and here at the top. And I'm just gonna confirm, David, give me a thumbs up if you see my mouse, because I'm doing a lot of here's. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so now let's imagine that the next, next substitution happens, and it's gonna happen in this gene here. If a new substitution happens here, it could potentially build an incompatibility or like, you know, result in an incompatibility in this edge or in this edge or in this edge. Well, what happens is that all of the genes that it could be incompatible with are already involved in an um, incompatibility themselves. So the result would not be a new pair, but rather a complex DMI, right? So that ca causes that, like, if you have networks that are very highly connected, then they tend to become, they tend to, in quotes, complexify, that's to borrow a term from, Atacali Rudd and uh, Ricardo Acevedo's work. So in other words, if you have a low connectivity network, you expect that the DMIs, so the pairs, snowball, and the sterility loci, so what, for example, Leone, Moyal, and Takasato were able to quantify with their snowball test, where these QTLs, this two lines kind of track each other pretty well. But if you have a high connectivity network, even though this solid green line continues to represent the DMIs, even though this line continues to snowball, the sterility loci start to accumulate at a rather linear way because you don't accumulate a pair every time. So that was the initial intuition. I think that there is uh, definitely some consistency in the kind of what we imagine is happening at the gene network level and the uh, uh, initial results for Moyle and Nakasato. So we would be in a scenario in which for seed fertility, the network might be a little bit more sparse and the sterility QTL or sterility loci do track the snowball effect. Whereas in the pollen fertility side, the kind of density or the, the, the how, how highly connected this network is uh, leads to a kind of decoupling of that snowball. Okay, so now that we've established that, or like we kind of started on in this kind of intuition of uh, gene networks and snowball patterns, we wanted to take it a little further and explore how um, or if network topology itself, so the shape of the network, affects the snowball. 
in, in particular, I was interested in um, testing whether very, very different networks uh, would result in very different snowball patterns. I'm, um, th these, I'm, I'm showing you here three very different models of how networks can be built. Or ran this is a random network. There's no biology here. A network can be fully connected or it can be a complete graph where when all nodes have edges to all other nodes. So each circle is definitely connected to all other circles here. It could be a small world type of network. This is roughly the case when, th this is the case when roughly all nodes have an equal number of edges. So for example, this cartoon was built with um, each node having roughly five to seven nodes. There's a little bit of noise there, but every node has kind like on average, the same number of connections uh, to other nodes. And then lastly, scale-free networks, which have some people say are very, very likely in biological systems. So biological networks tend to fall into kind of this scale-free topology are uh, networks that follow a power law distribution of their degree, or sorry, a power, yeah, their degree distribution follow, follows a power law. That is, there are some nodes, some genes that are hubs and have a lot of connections, but there's just a few of those. And then most of the genes have one or two, very, very few connections. They're kind of like the satellites of those hubs. Okay, so I'm gonna test that and we're gonna do that by simulation. So I wanna build a simulation. The way I'm gonna do that is not really, I'm not gonna try to get networks that diverge. Rather, I'm gonna assume that there's an underlying gene network. You can imagine it as the ancestral gene network. And I'm going to start to pick edges from that network to represent where the incompatibilities happened. In my very, very simple simulations, we have only three parameters. Uh, well, in, in, in addition to the parameters that we use to uh, create the degree distribution of the network. It's the number of, edge, number of genes or dots here, loci, the number of edges, and the incompatibility parameter that I'm, I'm using to be able to compare networks that have different numbers of edges. So this incompatibility parameter C, I'm going to divide by the number of edges, and I'm going to say that P, equivalent to that kind of initial or probability of incompatibility for everybody, that um, that, that little P is uh, you know, what represents the probability of an edge existing in my resulting incompatibility network. So I'm going to, th this is kind of how it works. I start my simulation with just picking a node. Of course, for the first one, there's no possible incompatibilities that can happen. For the second one, there's a single edge that could happen. It is, it happens with probability P, it would get picked. Second one, of course, it has probably 2P. And maybe with some good luck, we have a new edge in our resulting incompatibility network. I can keep going and P's continue to appear, three in this case four in this other case, and then let's say that this one little edge became incompatible thanks to that substitution. Okay, so now I'm gonna be looking into this resulting incompatibility network. This is how I summarize the data. So in this particular uh, kind of very, very brief simulation that I showed you, I have two edges that represent two DMI pairs or pairwise incompatibilities. Four nodes are in, involved in uh, incompatibilities. That would be the equivalent of the sterility loci that uh, we had earlier in tomatoes. And two clusters. I'm going to call them clusters, or although they represent the actual DMIs, because they can become uh, of higher order. So they could be more than the pairs. For example, if there was one more, only one more incompatibility here, I would have three edges, so three separate DMI pairs the same number of nodes and only just one cluster, one kind of four-way interaction here. And I'm being pretty cautious with the language of cluster versus higher order interactions because for some people, higher order interactions depend, like our own, our episodic interactions that happen only when the four state, like they're not the compound of four pairs. They're more than that, right? Okay, this is how I'm gonna show you the results. This is Orr's initial model. It has the snowball for DMIs and DMI pairs. It are completely overlaps because he only allows pairs to happen. And then the snowball for sterility loci that is roughly two times this because you, know, you can imagine that each DMI has two loci and they're always different. So you can it is roughly two times that. 
But instead of showing you these curves that are a little bit harder to kind of pick apart and like see very small uh, differences, I'm gonna just take the first derivative of this, or basically I'm gonna show you the slope of this that is supposed to be two times the, the number of substitutions times P. I'm gonna put it in a dashed line here as a kind of reference line. So we expect the snowball to increase in speed, of course, because the snowball is accelerating with time. And the, the same would be true for the, sorry, the snowball for DMIs and the same would be true for the snowball of sterility loci. Okay. So these are, Okay, these are the initial results. If I assume <clears throat> a modest value for the probability of incompatibility, there are certain departures. There are definitely some departures from the original snowball or like, let's call it plain snowball model. This happens interestingly for all three types of networks. These are very, very different networks. And yet the slowdown happens for all of them in a qualitatively similar way. The, main difference between these like the dashed line and the solid line here so or's original model and the model i'm presenting here is the infinite sites basically i'm saying here that this is a gene network and a gene can accumulate multiple substitutions so i can pick that little node multiple times and that is the cause of this this particular um, difference or like the the main driving force between or the, the of the difference between the dashed line and the solid line so just to kind of walk you slowly through that, what I'm representing here is that even though there's a quadratic growth at the initial, initial stages of the snowball, as time goes by, some nodes get picked again that were already part of the incompatibility network. And so you, the, the number of DMI pairs or DMIs doesn't really grow or doesn't grow as fast. So this is a slowdown of the, of the snowball. And it happens for small world and scale-free distributions. Maybe there's a, a little bit of a larger effect for scale-free distributions, which is expected if you imagine that once you hit a hub, if that hub is very highly connected, it will be likely to become a complex incompatibility. Okay, the snowball completely breaks down if the incompatibility, prob the probability of incompatibility is much larger. So, Again, just to kind of revisit, if you have something that is not even close to that uh, kind of dash line, then you have, if you have something like this, something flat like this, these lines here, the green DMI lines, it means that the growth is not linear, not quadratic or faster than linear at all. In, in fact, there's a slowdown of the snowball and that's because DMIs are coming together. You're losing total number of DMIs by bringing, complexifying those DMIs. So you just, when you had like two pairs, now you suddenly have one larger uh, three-way interaction. Okay, so I think that we will we'll continue to explore this and what it, impl it will imply for real networks. For example, we are currently working with um, my postdoc Eugene Brood on how to, imp uh, how to port these to real networks. Uh, we're using a yeast case and it seems like our, the, what our models imply is that for real biological systems, these our results, our gene networks simulations might be closer to reality than Orr's model. Although I would say that if you are just wanting an intuition for how speciation is going to happen, Orr's model is remarkably robust. It also means that there is a little bit more nuance to that saturation. It could start so like the patterns that are away from the snowball happen a little bit earlier than we thought. I'm here showing you kind of the original, um, one, one instance of my simulation against kind of an original quadratic shape here, where it shows that sterility loci can grow in a very kind of straight, flat, or you know, linear looking way. And DMIs could even just kind of come together in a hairball into a single DMI, like, like the one for poly. All right, I will transition to part two of today. I'm gonna tell you now about uh, sex determination and sex chromosome evolution in this lovely dioecious nightshade. Um, Solanum apiniculatum is, uh, is one of just a handful of independent origins 
of Daisy in a genus that is largely dominated by hermaphrodites and includes uh, really tasty crops like tomato, potato, eggplant, lulo for those uh, Latin Americans in the crowd uh, or naranjillo. And, and so there's a lot of interest in this genus. But I am interested in, the, in understanding the forces that drive divergence between the sex chromosome pair, leading to chromosomes like the ones I'm showing you on the screen that are the X and the Y of humans. So um, I want to understand what led to the loss of gene content in the Y and why, for example, what drives the cessation or the suppression of recombination between the two. Uh, I'm really interested in that. Uh, particular case. Of course, the, evol the evolutionary trajectory of sex chromosomes starts, we think, from a pair of autosomes. So originally, we think that sex chromosomes should look very much the same. We, I'm going to call those proto-sex chromosomes. This to me, actually, I will refer to this as just a sex chromosome, a young sex chromosome. That is the pair of chromosomes that holds a locus that determines sex. And there's something very interesting about the genomic region surrounding this sex determining locus it, because it allows for the maintenance of sex antagonistic polymorphism in a way that wouldn't happen elsewhere in the genome. So imagine that we have a locus, uh, locus A with alleles li little a and big A, and let's say that little a is pretty good for males and uh, but very, very bad for females, and the opposite is true for big A, right? So that in in other places in the genome, the tension, the trade-off should like need to be absolutely identical for the polymorphism to be um, stable, to persist in nature. But if you get closer and closer to this sex de determining determ uh, sex determining locus, what you have is a more kind of flexible or more favorable um, region for the maintenance of these kind of antagonistic or sexual conflict loci. Even if you have a sexually antagonistic balanced polymorphism, that is that still leads to sexual conflict in individuals because you there is still a little bit of recombination between the SDR, the sex determining region, and uh, the antagonistic locus, right? So you have a little bit of recombination, meaning that little a can occasionally still be in the context of a female, and big A can still appear and, and manifest itself in males. So we have two routes or two classic routes of resolution of that sexual conflict. The typical one that uh, um, is kind of involved in the, the generation of the Y chromosome is through cessation or suppression of recombination. So imagine that, for example, a chromosome inversion captures the Y and the little a allele. And so there's no more recombination between these regions of the genome here, which eventually leads to divergence, loss of genes, and just overall kind of puniness of the Y chromosome. Alternatively, you can have the, develop, the evolution of sex-specific expression. So a secondary mutation, for example, in the um, regulatory region of the A locus that I'm denoting here, this little A, little A star locus, that would invade and lose the polymorphism here, but it would accomplish uh, that gene expression of this particular gene is tied to the expression of sex. So, for example, little a star only expresses itself in the presence of a Y, conferring the, the, the benefit for the males without uh, incurring in, um, in the cost of females. Okay, so one strategy to learn about this whole process of sex chromosome evolution and divergence is to tackle or study species that are in early stages of the process, right? So right around here. And that's where, that, that's where I'm the most interested in. So that's why we went to Solanum appendiculatum, who is, that, that is this nightshade with a young dioecia system, right? So I'm showing you on the screen, the flowers, the male flowers, with no carpels and the male, the female flowers, which do have some male parts, but do not produce um, fertile pollen. This um, species, this Aisha species has a hermaphroditic sister species around 4 million years ago. So it hasn't had a lot of evolutionary time to diverge. And in fact, at the karyotypic level, um, studies done by Greg Anderson in the 90s, they didn't find any sort of divergence in the in the sex chromosomes or at the 
you know, be, between the characters of the sex chromosomes. In fact, we don't even know if the uh, solanum appendicularum is an XY system in which males are hetero karyotypic, or if it is a ZW system in which females are the heterozygotes. Um, so with the goal of setting up this as a system for the study of young sex chromosomes, we set out to characterize the genetic underpinnings of DIEC in uh, Solanum appendicularum, and we're going to take a genomic and transcriptomic approach to kind of set up the ground for the test of the theoretical uh, predictions that I'm interested in that I showed you in that earlier uh, model or trajectory. Okay, this is very quickly, a quick overview of what we did. Um, we took Illumina and PacBio reads at very high depth for just one male and one female, and we combined those because we were expecting a very small sex determining region. We were able to combine them into a single kind of hybrid assembly of sorts. And independently, we uh, took Illumina reads from five additional males and females. And so we have six males and six females. We can we uh, asked if there were any sex specific camers. Those are private camers defined as chunks of thirty base pairs that were detected in all samples of one sex, but absent in the samples of the other. So, um, and then we're gonna we use those to infer putative sex determination regions. I'll show you that in a second. We also complemented that approach with RNA seq from flower buds and mature flowers for three males and three females. That allowed us to build some annotation and also carry out some differential gene expression. Here are some statistics for genome assembly nerds. It's like a, just an average draft assembly with decent completion, uh, Busco completeness rather, uh, and pretty small N50. Okay, so because actually we had this draft assembly, we needed to rely on the sex specific camera approach to come up with sex specific regions. The way uh, we found, we try to found, find statistical support for our putative sex determination regions was that we also counted uh, private gamers in 100 combinations of six samples from our data set. And we recorded the gamers that were present in those six randomly chosen individuals and completely absent from the remaining six. And so we can plot those pseudo sampled gamers and create a kind of null distribution of sorts. So I'm showing you here on the x-axis, 10 KB windows all throughout the genome, ranked by the content of private chimers. Um, so these are the top 20 windows for each one. Each one of these gray lines is a pseudo sample. And then uh, how many of those pseudo, sorry, how many of those private chimers as a percentage are mapped to that specific 10 KB window. So there's the top window is always gonna be a little bit enriched and then towards the 20th uh, 10KB window, it seems like pretty noisy. That's, this is how the null distribution looks like then. And this is how the actual data looks like. So in blue, I'm showing you how the private camers or the sex specific camers for males look like. And in orange, I'm showing you how the female counterpart looks like. And I think that we, we, we think that this is pretty strong evidence that suggests that the top 10KB windows for males have a stronger signal that is way le less likely to be noise from our camera sampling. So we're gonna go ahead and um, stick our neck out there and say that we think that solanum appendicularum is an XY system, albeit a, a very, very young one. This is how those putative sex determination region looks, regions look. I'm showing you here in gray, in these gray bands, those are the 10 KB regions that were uh, flagged by our method. I, I should have mentioned too that they were accumulated in only two scaffolds. Uh, on the first panel, I'm showing you the sex specific camer count. So those kind of 30 base pair re, uh, reads or sorry, sequences that were enriched or present in males and non-females and the histogram of that. Then just for completeness, I'm, uh, I'm showing you here that these are pretty genic regions. They're not particularly depoppered from like they're, they're not gene poor regions. These are open reading frames we uh, inferred computationally. Third panel, I'm showing you the read depths, um, blue for males, orange for females, showing very, very little difference in coverage. So if you have a highly diverged 
sex chromosome pair or sex determining region, you would expect that um, you would have half of the coverage, so a two to one ratio of uh, read depth for between the you know, homozygote sex and the heterozygote sex, right? So the, the, for example, males, if they carry a Y chromosome and the, the Y chromosome does not have any of the content of the X, then they're hemizygous and we would have half of the reads here. That is not the case at all. We, we have very, very few, very little differences, maybe a little peak of the divergence here, but overall very few differences at that state. And then I'm showing you here a fourth panel that kind of gives us another view of the divergence process uh, in the statistic DXY, that is just kind of absolute divergence buildup between males and females. It is pretty noisy here. Uh, I'm showing you for reference the 99th percentile. So anything above this line, you can think about as a kind of outlier of divergence between males and females. There are some peaks and it is enriched for peaks uh, throughout the genome, uh, enriched for outliers, you could say, but you can also see that there are a lot of regions that have pretty low divergence between, or you know, close to median, the genome-wide median, um, males and female divergence. That to me says that there, this is, if this is the SDR, the sex determining region, it is a very young one that probably has not re suppressed recombination yet. And um, I guess if we assume that there's a mutation rate of roughly 10 to negative eight, and we assume this value of DXY, we can kind of back calculate with a very simple little napkin calculation that the sex determination uh, system evolved roughly 1.2 million years ago. We found a modest amount of sex bias gene expression in flower buds and um, higher, but still pretty minor divergence in sex bias gene expression in mature flowers. And since we think of sex specificity of gene expression as something that accumulates with time since origin of the system, then this observation confirms or is also concordant with a young sex determination system. In other words, this low sexual dimorphism suggests that there hasn't been a lot of um, uh, divergence at the genomic level. Okay, one thing that I wanted to mention, but I don't have a lot of time to like dive really deep into is that we found loads of pectin related genes in several of our, in multiple of our genomic approaches or computational approaches. So we found five genes family expansions. We found enrichment of pectin regulated regulatory genes and the differential expression genes. And they were pectin related genes in the gene annotation of the sex linked regions that I just showed you. And this is interesting because um, as I told you before, females in appendicularum produce pollen, but it is inaperturate. That means it lacks these grooves, these pores that are necessary for the adequate kind of opening and developing on the pollen tube. So pectin sounds like a like fun candidate or pectin regulation sounds like a fun candidate pathway to explore as uh, involved in sex determination. Okay, so now we're in a pretty good place maybe to start uh, testing theoretical predictions in a pretty preliminary way. I'm gonna show you uh, one specific prediction. So I'm gonna focus on this kind of bottom path of the um, resolution of sexual conflict. And it would be an extension of Bill Rice's work from the 80s. So he, he um, Bill Rice, uh, proposed that there should be an accumulation of genes that are involved in sexual dimorphism in the pseudoautosomal regions, because since there is an accumulation of sexually antagonistic loci, uh, so polymorphism here, there should be more of these throughout the genome. And if they get resolved through this sex, ex sex specific expression uh, more often, then we should see an enrichment of sex biased gene expression in the par in the pseudoautosoma region or near the sex chromosomes with respect to the autosomes. In Solanum appendicularum, that is not the case. If anything, there's a weird little bump here of uh, elsewhere in the genome. So what I'm showing you here are the results for the same, using the same RNA-seq experiment that I showed you earlier. And I'm just plotting the percent of genes with sex bias gene expression in sex link scaffolds versus elsewhere. Um, and there's no enrichment of sex bias gene expression in these sex linked scaffolds. So, I mean, you can say, well, there's, I, you just told me that there's no sexual dimorphism. So why would there be a lot of, you know, 
sexual dimorphism or like accumulation of sexual uh, sex antagonistic polymorphism in the par or in the near, near the sex chromosomes. So that is absolutely the case, but it does suggest that even so if you have the, the little bit of sex bias gene expression is happening throughout the genome. And it, so it suggests that there's something, there's another mechanism for accomplishing the sex bias polymorphism. This could be related to that pleiotropy mechanism suggested by Bill Rice. So the idea is that instead of needing two steps, so one polymorphic step at the sex antagonistic locus, and then a secondary uh, step that gives you specific ex sex specific expression, you could just do it in a single step. And the reason for um, this model not or like this avenue to not be very likely in young systems is that you think you can think about it as a kind of mutational target thing, right? Like you don't think that there's a lot of genes, a lot of dimorphism that your new sex specific genes can kind of cling on to. In other words, imagine mammals in which there is a highly canalized phenotype. And so males and females produce very different, like have diverged for a very long time. And so a new mutation that maybe hijacks or jumps into the sex specific pathway, jumping onto SRY or something like that would be a lot easier than in something that evolved very recently. Okay, um, while we haven't, well, well there's no, uh, um, question that maybe Solanum pendiculatum ends up not being a very good uh, species to ask this particular question. It is also true that we haven't found um, accumulation in other species. So this is preliminary work that um, my grad student Maha Amir has been tackling, I'm showing you um, two different, two species that I had not mentioned before, spinach and persimmon. They're both dioecious with XY systems. They're not too old. This one has a 10 megabase SDR, this one has uh, sex determination region. So there's definitely cessation of recombination. This one has a one megabase um, sex determination region. And neither of their X chromosomes colored in purple seems to be overrepresented in the kind of distribution of genes of sex bias with sex bias gene expression. It is also the case if we look at it in a different way. So now I'm showing you two other species, hemp, cannabis sativa, and populus uh, trichocarpa, the poplar. They have SDRs with very, of di very different sizes. I'm coloring that in the whole region in blue. X-axis is the um, posi uh, position along the X chromosome, and in blue is the whole non-recombining region. It's very tiny for poplar, pretty large for hemp. But you can see that there is no enrichment of uh, in the fraction of genes for with sex bias expression in either case. Um, and now to extend our kind of uh, realm of genomic resources in Solanum, we want to, what we're working on right now is to um, basically repeat what we've done with Appendicularum with all these beautiful new technology that we have with high, hopefully chromosome level assemblies for Solanum polygamum, a species that has much, much higher sex uh, dimorphism. So the flowers are very, uh, com considerably more different than they are in appendicularum. And then we're hoping to take a kind of comparative genomics approach in which we take pairs of dioecious Solanum and their closest kind of uh, hermaphroditic uh, crops. So for example, this is uh, uh, eggplant and this is uh, tomato over here and potato. So with that, I would just like to close with reminding you of the kind of take home message that Solanum appendicularum has a homomorphic XY system, that we think that there's some pectin regulation involved in the in dicey here, and that we did not find evidence that sex antagonistic polymorphism and the resolution of sexual conflict there uh, is playing a role in uh, sex bias gene expression, which begs uh, maybe the a little bit of a revision of the role of sex antagonistic selection in the evolution of sex chromosomes. With that, I would like to close by uh, thanking the people who did the work, especially Evgeny Brood uh, for the first part, and Mangu, who led the genome the genome part for Salama Paniculata, Maha Amir, who's working on the kind of second bit of other species that I showed you at the end. Of course, David Heck, your own, was involved in that project as well. That'll take some questions.
Fantastic. Thank you, Rob. So <clears throat> if you uh, would put your questions into the Q&A or the chat, um, and we already have one from uh, Silka Hauf, who asks, what could be an explanation why the connectivity of the networks looks different for seed and pollen? Silka qualifies that with not being a plant biologist, I have a hard time coming up with possible reasons. Right, there are a couple of reasons. Um, so I, I, I am not a plant biologist either, so I, my guess would probably be as good as yours. Uh, one possibility is that there is a bigger component of uh, the haploid phase in fitness for pollen. So not all pollen is haploid, but there is haploid bits inside of pollen. That's one thing, whereas uh, you know, seed is uh, the diploid phase for the most part. Um, a second probable cause is that um, there are very, like I can imagine it as the network being very tight in that there are very few ways to kind of screw up pollen like you, it's very early in development, right? Like you have to kind of knock out a few of the genes that just don't produce pollen or just screw up the pollen grain at all. Whereas seeds are like, this is silly to say, but more complex. And there's a lot of things that could go wrong in seed uh, uh, sprouting and growth. Um, so there's a possibility for like a bigger or more sparse net network there. But that is, I have no evidence for either of those. Um, so while people are thinking and trying to type, I'm going to ask a question. So, Rafa, what do you think about um, the idea or what evidence do you have that, that plants actually diverge at a different rate? Um, and so, you know, some animal systems, they tend to show, if I remember correctly, they tend to show gene expression differences way earlier. It, are plants just holding genes? I mean, is that a possible mechanism? Um, wait for the for the last bit for the um, yeah. gene expression yeah. uh, patterns. Um, yeah, so I I think that the um, there are a number of ways in which we do not know how gene is regulated in plants. So I I think that just to throw a kind of silly one out there, like if there's a bunch of small RNAs controlling uh, gene expression and uh, kind of a more genome-wide regulation of expression can be accomplished by like a, a small change in the small RNAs, but like very quickly switch to male or female. You can imagine how you jump onto that kind of male versus female specific expression without having to, you know, move your genes or something like that. I don't know if, actually, I don't know if I'm answering your question, to be honest. So you're, you're thinking about the rate of evolution or like the rate of divergence of gene expression in yep. animals versus plants. Yep. Um, is that really, really the case? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, you know, I, I'm a plant biologist, so that... <laughs> um, so... Well, I can think about results that we have for, so when we compared uh, close related species of tomato or like, you know, all the solanum, uh, if you do a PCA, a lot of those samples will cluster by tissue first and species second, right? So there's definitely a, uh, there's some conservation there. I think that very similar plots are true for things like, mammals, but maybe not a not not full scale mammals, but I do think that if you plotted uh, hmm, I don't know, maybe someone else in the audience will know. If if you plot like chimp versus humans, does the PCA of gene expression split first by species and then by tissue? I think that that's not the case. So I, I don't agree. think that there might be a I don't think that there's I mean that there, that would imply that there's not a very big difference in the rates of evolution there. I don't know. Hmm. I guess I punted on that one. Other mm. okay. questions? Watch if there are any other questions. Give people a minute. It's hard, it's hard with the webinar format. Mm -hmm.
So how far along is, is the, um, are you with sequencing on, on the, for the solanum comparison? Uh, we're doing pretty well. So uh, Greg Anderson, who's awesome, but an um, emeritus by now, was uh, super kind and grew some new polygamum. Um, and then we are starting to work with Alec Carcass at Hudson Alpha. He's like, really good at um, yep. exactly this question, basically. He's, he's done it in another species. Uh, how widespread do you think is the pectin regulation in sex determination? Uh, I think that, I, I'm trying to remember another case, but I did see recently that in other species, pectin was associated with sex determination, but it was not pollen related. Um, I think that there was a cell wall component of sorts um, that I can't really remember, but I actually think that, um, yeah, the, the, if you imagine pectin regulation as a general kind of cell wall thing, then you could have it involved in many ways and how you can break things. And so if the goal is to break the male parts or break the female parts, it could be pretty widespread. In Solanum appendicularum specifically, um, we don't have much more than just the signals that I told you about. So I couldn't really answer much more specifically than that. Um, awesome. All right, well, big virtual applause. Thank you, Rafael. This was a great seminar. Thank really you. enjoyed it. And thanks for coming, everybody. Um, for those interested in asking more detailed questions, we have a, a session, a Zoom session coming up at 1.15. And you can just look for, it's just my name. So it's just my personal room, David Hake. So you can find that. Um, look forward to seeing everybody again. Thanks, everybody.